We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I wanted to welcome everyone to the webinar this evening. I am your host and moderator, Dr. Lauren Levine. Uh, we have an amazing turnout this evening, uh, close to 1,300 people that were registered. Um, of course, I hope that everyone is staying healthy and safe. Uh, I, as always, I commend you for being here and giving up uh, 60 to 90 minutes of your time. Um, even though it's been a crappy year for everybody, uh, the, you know, the need for ongoing education certainly hasn't uh, ended, and uh, you're all showing that by, by being here this evening. I'm only going to speak for a couple of minutes or so. I, wa I want to make sure that Dr. Kaczynski can speak for as long as he wants. Many of you have been on webinars in the past, so I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going through the format, but um, we're going to do the presentation. It usually takes about 50 to 60 minutes, give or take. Um, you can ask questions by typing them into the control box that's on your uh, on your screen. We don't do verbal questions, obviously, with 1,300 people. It's impossible. And I don't get to the questions until the end. We almost always have significantly more questions than we have time to answer the questions. I go through the questions as they come in. I try to combine some together. I try to you know, hit the ones that are, I think are the key points. Uh, if I don't get to your question ahead of time, I, I Apologize for that, um, but we do try to get to as many questions as we can uh, during the, the course of, of the webinar. Within the next couple of days, you're going to see a couple of things. First off, this webinar is recorded. We record all these webinars. If for some reason you don't make it until the end or get distracted, don't worry about it. You can always download and, and watch it at, at your convenience. That typically goes out within uh, about a day or two. During the webinar, uh, Dr. Kaczynski is going to be so, showing some products which he uses, which are exclusive to Golden Dental. Um, as always, I want to thank Golden Dent for their sponsorship. These webinars don't happen on their own. It takes a lot of planning, uh, a lot of commitment to get the invitations out and uh, to make sure everyone gets invited, to, to develop the content, to bring in excellent speakers, um, and of course, to, to handle uh, the continuing education stuff. Uh, speaking of that, and I, every webinar I do, I oftentimes get dozens of emails afterwards. What about the CE? What about the CE? I'm going to mention it a few times this evening, so hopefully people that were here now, people that come in a little bit later will also hear it as well. Um, if you are here and you stay for the webinar, you will be sent a CE form. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the requirements are for AGD Pace. I think it's like 70 or 80% of the time. Um, there's nothing more that you need to do. As long as you're here, you'll be sent that CE form. There's no quiz. There's no nothing to take at the end of the webinar. Um, it just gets sent out by email. Uh, it does take a little bit of time. When we have 1,300 people, it can take a few weeks for that to go out, so please be patient, but they do always send them out. Um, with that out of the way, I wanted to welcome back our speaker. Um, honestly, if I went through his whole bio, we wouldn't have time for any of the content, so I'm not going to read everything. Uh, any of you that speak Yiddish, uh, he's a Gansemacher. Uh, for those of you who don't know Yiddish, it means he's a big shot. Uh, but Tim Kaczynski, he's an affiliated adjunct clinical professor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. He's on the editorial review board of Reality. Um, he is the past editor of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He's currently the editor of the AGD Journals. Um, he was recently named editor of Implants Today, which is part of Dentistry Today. Past president of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. Um, he got, he's a practicing dentist. He got his DDS from University of Detroit. He got a mastership in biochemistry from Wayne State University. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry. Uh, ICOI, the American Society of Osteointegration. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and got his mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, if you're in the dental field, then you probably know who he is because he's out there. He's received many honors, including fellowship in the American and International Colleges of Dentists and the Academy of Dentistry International. About three, four years ago, he got the Academy of Dentistry International's Humanitarian Award. Uh, he's a member of OKU, the Pierre Fouchard Academy. He was a uh, University of Detroit School of Dentistry Alumni Association's Alumnus of the Year um, in 2019, uh, 2014, and in 2020 received the AGD's Lifelong Learning and Service Recognition. Uh, when it comes to implants, he's done a few of them, like around 15,000 or so. Uh, he's published more than 200 articles on 
surgical and prosthetic phases of implant dentistry. He's contributed to numerous textbooks, including Principles and Practice of Implant Dentistry um, and Dental Implantation and Technology. Uh, and any of you that have ever seen Noble BioCare's uh, Noble Vision, he's featured prominently on there. He lectures extensively, and we are thrilled to have him here this evening. So, Tim, welcome back, and we're looking forward to tonight's presentation. Thank you, Lauren. You always make me laugh. <laughs> so, hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll spend the next hour or so together and um, show you some of the things that that we do in our practice um, just just about every day, Lauren. Um, I know implant dentistry is is the hot topic, and I know our courses uh, fill up very quickly. And um, doctors at all different experience levels um, are getting involved, and I really appreciate that. Being a general dentist, I think it's imperative um, that general dentists out there learn these these procedures. Um, but the slam dunks aren't always there. And uh, oftentimes we have challenging situations where we may not have adequate hard tissue to predictably place our implants um, comfortably. Um, and so today's topic is, is um, mostly grafting techniques, Lauren, um, in preparation for dental implants, some immediate implant placement, uh, but grafting is, is a very, very important part of what we do in implant dentistry. And I think it's imperative that, that all the dentists out there um, get educated, uh, hopefully with some participation or hands-on courses um, on, on different grafting techniques. Now, th there's a there's hundred ways to do what I'm doing. Um, and, and I know we're gonna get questions at the end about some, some uh, viable alternatives. But we don't have time to go all over all that today. What I'm going to show you are just a couple of materials um, that I use very predictably in my practice that, um, and, and the protocol that I use to get the successes that, that we get. Um, I like to say that um, we can grow bone facially 100% of the time. And I know that it, that's a very bold statement to make. Um, but it really is true as long as you're following a certain protocol and, and procedure, recipe, so to speak. Um, and so once we are able to achieve that and understand the principles of, of bone physiology, um, we are able to predictably um, really provide a, an incredible service to our patients. Some of the things I'm gonna show you are a little bit more advanced, uh, but that's why we call it advanced extraction and grafting techniques. Um, and so a lot, a lot of these cases are brand new for some of you who have uh, watched these webinars before and hope you, hopefully you'll appreciate it and, and take this information that we're gonna kind of superficially discuss um, and, and uh, take some courses and, and learn how to do this the, the correct way. Um, and Lauren, you did a great, a great um, <laughs> introduction. Again, you always make me laugh. But a lot of the cases that we show uh, tonight uh, are on my education website, drkaczynski.com. Uh, a lot of our videos um, that we've, we've created over the years. So that would be a good resource for, for those of you who would like some more in-depth information about the um, um, cases that we're showing today uh, specifically. Um, we're gonna talk about some surgical techniques um, for uh, my, what I like to call atraumatic extraction techniques. I know sometimes I'm criticized for that term, although I hear more and more speakers talk about traumatic extractions, minimally traumatic extractions. Uh, and when we're talking about um, uh, atraumatic or minimally traumatic, we're talking about uh, the patient's reaction to the extraction. Uh, we're talking about uh, maintaining uh, valuable hard tissue, val valuable bone, and also atraumatic to the doctor because extracting teeth can be very, very uh, challenging um, to us uh, as dental practitioners. And we're gonna learn uh, some socket preservation techniques, uh, including um, uh, reflection design. Uh, we're gonna talk about ridge expansion using a piezo. Uh, we're gonna talk about platelet-rich fibrin techniques and how I use that um, as my membrane. And also we'll do a, a case on a, a sinus uh, tenting procedure that, that the general dentists out there certainly are capable of doing this with, with proper training. Um, and then most of the cases, uh, we're gonna talk about immediate implant placement. Now here, I'm not talking necessarily about immediate load. I'm not, I'm not a big immediate load person. I just watched another webinar this afternoon and it was, I was very impressed by that. But after 36 years of practice, um, we get set in our ways. And um, um, when, when we go through the surgical procedures, we try to 
to really manage it and get the results that we um, that we want. So let's look at the uh, maxillary anterior. Let's talk about extraction techniques and grafting and an immediate implant placement. So this is a, a young man that, uh, that presented to us um, with um, teeth that were deemed non-restorable. Um, had some implants before, and um, so we decided to, to remove these teeth and to uh, place dental implants immediately. So how do we do that? Well, um, I will use the, the golden uh, gold dent physics forcep, and many of you have heard me talk about the physics forcep. It's an instrument, uh, an extraction um, system that I would not practice without. Uh, certainly, it, it, it is my favorite instrument to use to remove, remove teeth, and we're not going to focus too much on it, but I do want to demonstrate it. Um, here, I'm simply taking a periotome and going around the tooth. Uh, making sure in this in, in this situation, making sure that we have profound anesthesia uh, of the site. And this this is the physics forcep um, set. It's a series of four instruments: um, upper right, upper anterior, upper left, and a lower universal instrument. The little green covering is a little silicone um, covering um, that kind of uh, protects the soft tissue to some degree. These are disposable. Um, little inserts that we use. So the bumper guard is placed on the 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 uh, bulk end or the bumper end of the uh, instrument. The bumper is not the working end of the instrument. And many of you have heard me say this before. The working end of the instrument is the serrated beak. And this serrated beak is placed one to three millimeters subgingival on the palatal or lingual aspect of the tooth. We call this a forcep, but but I wish we didn't call it a forcep because it's really more of a luxator or an elevator. And what we hope to do is um, simply with this with the very specific design of this instrument, um, without ever squeezing the handles of the instrument, we're creating tension on the lingual or palatal aspect of the tooth. This tension is going to create energy, a physiologic response, so to speak that is going to um, result in enzyme release and a breakdown of the periodontal ligament. What's holding the tooth in place? The periodontal ligament. So if the periodontal ligament is melted away physiologically, the tooth will disengage up and out of the socket. And again, we're never squeezing the instrument. Now, the bumper is placed as high up or as far down below the vestibule as possible. It is simply a center of rotation. It is not holding the facial plate of bone. It is not the working end of the instrument. It simply acts as a fulcrum to allow the instrument to, to make that arc of rotation and create tension on the lingual or palatal aspect of a tooth. So here you can see, um, um, I'm taking my thumb and I'm putting the, the beak onto the lingual as or the palatal aspect of this tooth as far down as I can. You need a purchase point. The bumper is placed as high up the vestibule as possible, and without squeezing the handles, I'm simply rotating my wrist. So there's no forearm, there's no bicep, there's no shoulder pressure whatsoever. I'm very lightly holding the instrument and rotating my wrist towards the corner of the eye in this situation. Now, it may take a minute or two. Now, I know that's forever for us dentists, but you're creating constant tension onto the palatal aspect of this tooth. And in a very short amount of time, this tooth will disengage up and out of the socket. You can see I'm really holding it with the palm of my hand and one finger and simply rotating the wrist towards the corner of the eye. The instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total. Rather, it's intended to luxate it up and out of the socket um, a, a little bit. I then take what we call a tooth delivery instrument, like a bird beak um, forcep, and I'm simply able to remove that tooth in total, maintaining the facial plate of bone uh, to the best of my ability, um, and doing what we call an atraumatic extraction. Oftentimes, the patients are not even aware that you take this tooth out because you're not squeezing it. You're not putting a pressure on it. You're not doing figure eights or buccal lingual or buccal palatal. Uh, rotations. Um, and so the patient's experience with this 
is, is rather positive in many respects. And many of you say, okay, um, you know, lateral incisor, big deal. So let's do a cuspid tooth, same procedure, placing the beak on the palatal aspect, one to three millimeters subgingival. The bumper is placed as high up the vestibule as possible. And I'm simply rotating my wrist. We're going to dislodge and you can see we're able to remove this tooth without da damaging the facial plate of bone whatsoever. This is a long, long cuspid tooth. You have to remember to take your time. And I know um, Golden Dent, I'm sure we'll have some specials at the end of the program. And I understand that um, we are going to start our live uh, patient courses at our University of Detroit Mercy Dental School in the fall. So for those of you who want to become really proficient uh, in this technique, um, come to our university and um, you'll, you'll be removing a lot of tooth under, under direct supervision of some, some wonderful mentors. So when we take a tooth out, the, the first thing we have to do is, is to, number one, eliminate the granulation tissue that may be present. So we're taking a sharp curette. Again, these are purchased through Golden Dent. Uh, and I'm simply uh, scratching the surface of the uh, internal portion of the socket. But I'm also evaluating the facial plate of bone. I want to see if there's a facial plate of bone. If there's any question, in this situation, I'm going to make a reflection. And many of you have heard me talk about reflection techniques where we, we talk about an envelope reflection or an envelope flap, meaning I'm not making any vertical incisions onto the, uh, onto the, the, the soft tissue. I do not want to incise into mucosal tissue if I can help it. I try to keep my incision into attached gingiva. If you incise into mucosa vertically, you are going to have a patient who is going to be uncomfortable. Prostaglandin and histamine will be released. And secondarily, it's oftentimes challenging to suture that reflection back into position when you make a vertical incision. The flap wants to kind of go all over the place. So here I took uh, what's referred to as an Orban knife. It's a specially shaped instrument, a uh, stainless steel instrument that is a cutting instrument. And I'm simply um, incising through the, the surgical site and around the adjacent teeth. And I'm elevating. And you can see I don't have any vertical incisions. Now I can clearly see the facial plate of bone in this situation. And you can clearly see that there is a facial defect here. You would not see that in a, a digital radiograph because you would only see the palatal bone. So we did not damage this bone. That bone was either very thin or damaged because of the, uh, um, the infection that was, was present. And you can see I'm scooping out uh, infected granulation tissue. So curette, 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 curette. Red blood is good, purple blood is bad. You want to make sure that site is as clean as possible. I'm also elevating or reflecting the palatal surface. Why am I doing this? Because if we have a facial defect and we're going to graft, we must protect that graft from invagination of epithelium. And we're gonna use a, two different materials uh, in my demonstrations today. And to do that, we have to passively have some type of membrane that will prevent this invagination of epithelium into my socket site. So I'm also elevating the palatal tissue so that I can place my membrane passively at least two millimeters beyond any defect. The membrane must be intact for at least six weeks, doctors. And those of you who have, have done grafting and have not got, uh, gotten the, the results that you want, oftentimes the membrane is dislodged before that six week period. If the membrane is dislodged before the six week period, then the case becomes unpredictable. I don't know if it's going to work or not. I want to know that my cases are working. The patients are paying a lot of money. It's an invasive procedure. I want to try to ensure a positive result wherever possible. So you can see my reflection facially is beyond the defect and my, fate, my reflection palatally uh, allows me to get a, a very, very um, nice passively, passive placement. Now, we're not going to talk about types of implants, um, but with every implant system, you usually start with some type of pilot burr, which allows us to determine um, angulation mesial distally and buccal lingually. 
I want to place this implant about three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth, that which allows for room for the uh, final abutment and final um, crown. And we're also engaging that palatal aspect. I do not want to place this implant directly into the socket that we created. Number one, the facial plate of bone is oftentimes very, very thin in that area. And so it's, it's, it's best that we, we angle um, the, the osteotomy burrs into um, a substantial bone. We want to create initial stability. And our initial stability is created at the apical two millimeters uh, with our implant. And here we're just widening the osteotomy and then finally widening the osteotomy with my final burr. Now, one of the materials that I love is called the Osteogen Plug. And this is a, a synthetic material. It's a combination of bioactive uh, crystal particulate with impurified collagen matrix. Um, it's um, uh, calcium apatite in a bovine, bovine Achilles tendon collagen um, matrix. It's not a collagen plug, doctors. A collagen plug may last seven, maybe up to 14 days. I need a material that's going to last longer than that, and I need a membrane that's going to last at least six weeks. It has a very specific consistency that allows me to pack it firmly into a socket site. And we've done a lot of histology um, on this material, and we will get very objective bone turnover in a relatively short amount of time. So here I'm taking my um, uh, osteogen plug, and I'm simply placing it into the socket sites. I'm packing it firmly. It's not amalgam. We're not crushing it, but I'm packing it firmly into position. Now, because of the design of this material, we are able to thread our implant. Remember, I already made my osteotomy. We're able to thread the implant quite readily into that site. And the material will then ex extrude and fill in the void. The implant is actually a little as round and narrower as opposed to the socket site, which is egg shaped. And I will place this implant about one millimeter uh, subcrestal because physiologically we expect about a millimeter of bone loss uh, in an immediate implant placement. We then, um, I'm torquing the implant in position and we ended up torquing it to 25 Newton centimeters. Our initial torque is, is uh, achieved at the apical two millimeters of our implant. I'm then going to make the osteomyotomy in my second uh, implant site in the cuspid. <clears throat> Again, widening the osteotomy. And you can see uh, we can oftentimes harvest the autogenous bone uh, and use this in our, in our grafting procedures if you so choose. Again, positioning of this implant is critical. We are not placing it directly into the socket site, rather about three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of where we expect the tooth to, to achieve. And I did the same thing. I simply packed my osteogen material and threaded into it, and the material will spread out and fill in the void. And in this situation, I was able to torque this implant to 45 Newton centimeters, which is pretty amazing in, in a uh, immediate socket site. And you can see how the material fills in the void. I then, uh, because it's an immediate um, extraction site, and even though I did get fairly good torque, I'm putting cover screws or closure caps into the implants. And then I'm going to repair the facial aspect. Now, oftentimes, uh, and we will demonstrate uh, the different types of membranes that are available, but again, you need a membrane that's going to last at least six weeks. But here we do have osteogen sheets, this calcium appetite material sheets that I will pre-cut and I will simply place it beyond the defect and wrap it around over to the palatal tissue. And then suturing becomes very, very critical in this situation. We want primary closure. And many of you have seen, uh, if you've seen my lectures, you know that I really like this book from uh, Lee Silverstein, The Suture Book. Um, it is a great book. You can get it from Salvin Dental. Don't go on, don't go on Amazon. It's too expensive there. But um, Salvin Dental in Charlotte, North Carolina sells this book. 
It's schematic and it will really help you practice on oranges. Uh, sutures that I like to use, I like to use um, micro sutures from Golden Dent. Um, these are resorbable. These are re uh, resorbable sutures that are long lasting. They are they are a very nice uh, nice material, uh, polyglycolic acid. It's a synthetic material. Um, I like to bring my patients back in a week uh, to 10 days at the most to remove the sutures, but they will resorb uh, on their own in about uh, two weeks uh, and they resorb to water. So we don't see a lot of inflammation with this. But um, if you are using sutures, I would recommend that you talk to Kurt at Golden Dent uh, because the cost of this uh, particular product from Golden Dent is significantly less than many of the other manufacturers that I use. So I use the uh, polyglycolic acid synthetic absorbable. It's braided, uh, that's called, referred to as Vicro. Um, I don't use silk that often. You can use plain gut or chromic gut. Um, we will, I will use a reverse cutting needle and I will usually use a, a 3 8 or a half circle needle. And I will normally use a 3 or 4 um, uh, size of, of thread. Um, both work very, very well, uh, well in my hands. And so you can see I'm simply um, doing some interrupted sutures and trying to get some primary closure, trying to establish some semblance of uh, interdental papilla in the area as possible. And we get some primary closure and then the post-operative um, periapical radiograph, digital radiograph, you know, you can clearly see that the defect is larger than the implant itself, but over time we'll be able to objectively evaluate the digital radiograph and determine bone formation in that site. Here I made a, a, a quick, um, um, I had it pre-made a flipper appliance, removable um, uh, transitional appliance. I'm not putting pressure on the implant area, uh, whatsoever. One week post-op, you can see I'm able to remove the the uh, the vicral sutures, and we do get some um, some primary closure. Epithelium will grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day, so I'm not concerned that there's a little bit of showing of the graft material uh, because epithelium will not grow into a membrane of this type and it'll prevent invagination of epithelium into the graft site itself. And you can see one month post-op, we are getting some, some fairly decent healing. The laboratory then fabricated two nice custom uh, titanium abutments for me. You can see where my margins are at or slightly uh, subgingival. And then we did a couple zirconia bruxer crowns in the area. And you can see how the, the bone around the implants healed uh, fairly predictably, uh, getting us a fairly nice result. Now, grafting, as I said, or socket regeneration is critical. Um, if we graft at the time of an extraction, regardless if we place an implant or not, it does help minimize bone loss. It supports the soft tissue. Soft tissue is only supported by available bone. Uh, can prevent periodontal pathology, and it will provide an adequate site for implants in three to four uh, in three to four months or 12 to 16 weeks. If you extract a tooth and you don't graft, you are going to get soft tissue infiltration. You're going to get shrinkage up and in. And the literature says that we will get 30 to 60% bone loss in a three year period, which means that you may need a, the patient may need a more invasive uh, grafting procedure to be able to place implants in the future. Uh, failures with our grafting, as I mentioned earlier, we must protect the graft from invagination of epithelium. Uh, and so, uh, so making sure that our reflection is correct, placing the membrane at least two millimeters beyond the defect, making sure it's passively placed. Um, we pay, put our patients on an antibiotic, a low dose, amoxicillin, 500 milligrams, three times a day for three days. I'd like to start the day before if possible. And as I mentioned uh, in this demonstration, we're going to demonstrate where if we have all four walls intact or if the facial wall is missing. And if the facial wall is missing, we can grow bone on that facial wall. 
but we must protect it with a membrane. And there's many types of membranes out there. I would strongly suggest that you use a high quality membrane. Um, there are synthetic membranes. There are um, membranes ma made from porcine uh, um, per per pericardium, uh, which I think is, is what the golden dent is, um, or, or a porcine uh, peritoneum materials. There are synthetic materials, and then there's the osteogen plug sheets that we can use. EpiGuide is a, a synthetic material that I really, really like. Um, um, polylactic acid construction, uh, it lasts a long time, and I only need it to last six weeks. So I do not use a non-resorbable membrane in my practice anymore. I think it's important that we keep our inventory uh, as, as reasonable as we possibly can. And you don't need primary closure. Remember, epithelium will grow about a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So we need to know the different grafting materials. There, there's, I think there's 226 different materials. If you're going to use an allograft, meaning a bone from another human source, um, I really like the Goldoss particulate material. Uh, it has some osteoinductive as well as osteoconductive uh, properties. Um, it's a, um, a mineralized cortical cancellous mix uh, with a precise shape, very high quality and priced really, really well. So um, materials that we use for um, grafting procedures in my practice are the synthetic calcium apatite osteogen material or allograft materials. I don't use xenograft particularly in my practice. Autografts I obviously are, are the gold standard. And if you can harvest the bone that you that you uh, accumulate, um, it, it's a nice way to go. But there's so many products out there that I really limit to what works well in my hands that will work well in your hands. So let's look at a mandibular molar area. Again, a tooth that is deemed non-restorable. And we're going to, uh, because we have two roots there, I like to section into the, the septum area. And I will take my physics force up. And again, I will place the beak one to three millimeters um, uh, subgingival. I will put, place the bumper as far down the vestibule as possible and simple with simple rotation of my wrist in a matter of a minute without squeezing the handles. The tooth will dislodge up and out of the socket. And I'm able to remove this tooth relatively atraumatically or minimally traumatically even though there's a little curved root in this situation. Very predictable, um, saves my body, and it's, it's a, a, a more positive extraction for your patients. We take a radiograph to ensure that the entire root structure is removed. This is very important. I see a lot of root tips left uh, in the jaw, and, and, and it's frustrating for me as an implant person uh, because I have to remove those tooth roots. But I also know as a general dentist how challenging it can be to remove teeth and how, how, how difficult it can be. So the physics forcep is certainly a tool that I would not, again, I would not practice without. It's made me very proficient and efficient. I'm going to reflect the area with my Orban knife. And you can see that there's a facial defect there. We can't ignore this, okay? So, so if you're not sure, you wanna be able to see it. So reflect with what we call that envelope. Don't make any vertical incisions if you can help it. And here I'm simply going through the implant process. This happens to be the Han implant system, but um, the system that you use uh, will work, work just as well. We widen the osteotomy, we widen the osteotomy, and I'm going to place my implant. However, you can see that we have a significant defect where the uh, mesial root was and where the distal root was and on the facial aspect. So I'm going to graft with my uh, allograft material. What we do is we wet it with uh, sterile water or sterile saline. Never use anesthetic, please, uh, to wet your, your allograft material. The anesthetic is too acidic and it may, may inhibit um, uh, bone turnover. And you can simply see that I'm scooping and placing it around my implant. Now, what do we have to do now, doctors? We can't leave it like this. Epithelium grows 10 times faster than bone. The, 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 
the grafted site will heal from the apex towards the crest. Epithelium will grow from the crest towards the apex, which is going to grow faster, the epithelium. And this is the problem that we have with grafting procedures um, that, that we find that, that are unpredictable. Doctors, we must protect this graft from invagination of epithelium. And to do that, we have to place our membrane. So here we took our, our gold, uh, gold dent uh, membrane, resorbable membrane, and I'm placing it where? At least two millimeters beyond the facial defect. And I'm passively placing it, um, resting it on the lingual surface. So I don't have to hold this in place. I know it's not going anywhere. We suture. I'm not concerned about primary closure. And over time, we are going to objectively determine bone turnover. Immediate uh, graft placement, one week post-op, you can see that's, that's the membrane. I'm okay with that because epithelium is gonna grow over the top of it. It's not going to grow into the socket site. And in three months post-op, we have a great uh, implant site with a great band of attached gingiva. We remove our healing abutment and you can see the periodontal health that was created and the laboratory fabricates a nice uh, zirconia bruxer crown that we torque into place and put a little composite over. This is certainly within the realm of, of all of you here. Maxillary molar, um, I'm gonna go through this a little bit quicker. <clears throat> We, we have two teeth that are going to be removed. We'll do an osteogen plug on one side and a conventional allograft on the other. You can see we're going to remove these teeth. And you can see the damage of the tooth. Remove them as, as atraumatically or minimally traumatically as possible. And what do we do next? We curette. Curette, 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 and reflect the area so that you can see any defect. With the osteogen plug, I'm simply placing the material and, and condensing it into the three sockets. With our conventional grafting, you can see I took my membrane and I passively placed it at least two millimeters beyond the defect, so I don't have to hold it, I don't have to, to fight with it. Make that reflection, that reflection, that flap, is critical to the success of your grafting procedures. Immediate placement, I'll place the membrane on top. Now I don't need a membrane with my osteogen plug because the bovine collagen matrix prevents uh, epithelium from growing into it. Epithelium will follow the path of least resistance, uh, which means it has a choice. It can go into it or, or along the surface. And because it has a hard time going into the material, it'll grow along the surface. And again, I'm not concerned about primary closure with our materials. Post-operative radiographs, you can see there's some radiolucency there in both situations. One week post-op, you can see epithelium already growing over the top of it. My membrane, because it was passively placed, uh, is, is adhered to the site. One month post-op, you can see that the epithelium is healing wonderfully which gives us a great site for uh, an implant placement. The uh, radiographically, we can objectively see a change. Remember I said that bone is going to become uh, more mature at the apical portion of the socket, less mature at the uh, crestal portion, but that's okay because I'm going to place the implant and where am I gonna get my initial stability? At the apical two millimeters uh, of the area where we have the best bone formation. Our implants are placed. And here I did histology uh, of the osteogen plug, meaning I did a, a core sample before I placed the implant. And without getting into a lot of histology, it's getting late, um, the magenta color, that's new bone. The purple color is the uh, implanted material. And you can see the incredible amount of, of bone turnover um, that we achieved. This is very, very predictable dentistry at a very cost-effective uh, way, method. Um, just talk about uh, money. We're not supposed to talk, uh, we're, this is generalities. We're not talking specifically about our fees, but um, osteogen plug is $50. Uh, Vicryl suture, $16. However, I'm sure Kurt has specials today, which will reduce that. 
you have to understand what your overhead is. Um, and let's just use an average and over, overhead, your cost, your lights, your electricity, your staff time at being $400 an hour. If this is a 20 minute procedure, the profit margin is significant in this procedure. And it's preparing the site for a future implant, which we know is the most lucrative uh, procedure you can do in dentistry. If we go more conventionally and use allograft, uh, our allograft material is more expensive. We have to have a membrane which has cost to it. The vicryl is the same. It takes me a little bit longer to do this procedure because I have to reflect the area. I have to um, um, I have to take a little bit more time with my allograft material. So our profit margin um, is is reduced, even though I'm charging more for the membrane. So the benefit to the patient is is exceptional. So let's look at a, a full arch um, um, uh, case where we're going to, to uh, remove teeth that are deemed non-restorable. And again, taking my periotome and going around, and I'm simply taking my physics forcep after sectioning and removing the teeth. And you can see the granulation, the infected tissue there. Uh, is is pretty significant. So doctors, we're going to remove the bad teeth, right? And we're going to reflect the area. I want to see the defect. I want to clean out the granulation. Doctors, if you can see the infected site, if you can see the defects, you can correct it. We clean out the site, and here we're taking our osteogen um, plug material and I'm simply condensing it into the defects firmly. And here we have um, in our EpiGuide, our synthetic membrane material that again, I'm using to protect the graft material from invagination of epithelium. I wanna to try to maintain this ridge, this ridge as much as possible. The other side, doing the same thing, taking a large osteogen plug and suturing is very important. I'm looking at a band of attached gingiva in this site. And one week post-op, you can see how we don't get complete primary closure. Uh, and I'm not concerned with that because the epithelium will continue to grow half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So in another week or so, this area will be completely healed over. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, platelet-rich fibrin techniques in combination with block grafts. Uh, again, um, a very typical situation in our practice in the suburbs of Detroit, uh, teeth that are, are pretty infected, uh, non-restorable. We're going to use our physics forcep to remove the teeth as atraumatically as possible. You can see I'm, I'm, there's, no, there's no pressure at all. I'm simply rotating my wrist to remove these teeth. They're not, it's not intended to remove the tooth in total. We'll take what we call a tooth delivery instrument, remove those so roots, and we have sockets. What do you wanna do now, doctors? Do we have a facial plate? Are you sure? Are you not sure? So let's make a reflection. Let's make our envelope so that we can clearly see any infected areas and any defects, any bony spicules that we may have. I'm going to reflect the lingual tissue. Why is that important? So that we can passively place a membrane to prevent invagination of epithelium into our socket sites. I'm, I'm simply flattening the, um, the, the ridges, taking off the, the bony spicules, trying to get more of a flat plane. Uh, we're using our electric handpiece. And PRF, what we're doing is we're, we're, without getting too specific about it, and you can certainly Google search it, um, we, can, we can simply draw blood from, from the patient and spin that blood. And, and different companies have, have different techniques. I don't want to go into, into those specifics. But we have autologous platelets and leukocytes are present uh, in, the, in the complex fibrin matrix. And this helps accelerate healing of soft and hard tissue. 
and the blood is drawn into a test tube without an anticoagulant and it's centrifuged. The PRF releases several biologically active proteins, including platelet alpha factors, platelet rich bone morphogenic proteins. And after spinning, you can see that we will have like a clot, like a, a, a blob. We'll put it in our specially designed tray and I will flatten it. And it just flattened. Let it, let it sit there for five, uh, four or five minutes. And we now have our own created membrane that, will, that, that is made from the patient's own um, uh, physio uh, physiology. And we are going to get exceptionally quick, fast, predictable healing. So here again, I'm going to go ahead and do my osteotomies. Uh, small burr, wider burr, wider burr. I'm going to widen the osteotomy. I'm going to go one millimeter subcrestal, and I'm going to place my implant. The implant's torqued into position. Here it's, it's um, D1 bone. We were able to torque it to 40 newton centimeters, but we still have a defect there. I'm going to place my second implant, widening the osteotomy, placing the implants. And here we, we placed our implant. You can see there's a facial defect on the centermost implant. Putting cover screws. I'm going to put little, little um, um, drill points on the facial aspect. I want bleeding. Red blood is good uh, for bone formation. So I'm just notching it and getting bleeding sites. Here I'm taking my osteogen uh, material and I'm just packing it into the defected areas. This is a osteogen sheet that I'm using again to cover over the defects and packing it completely around those implants and the facial defect. And now I'm going to take my PRF material and this is going to be my Band-Aid. And this is going to allow for both um, uh, nice bone formation and soft tissue response to the area. But the, but the procedure is the same. I want it passively placed beyond the defect on the facial onto the uh, lingual aspect. We're going to suture. And one week post-op, we have pretty good healing, not complete healing, but pretty good healing. The implants are placed. We can evaluate them um, immediately radiographically. We can see the position of our implants is adequate with our, our, our CBCT postoperative analysis. And each of the implant looks like it's in pretty good position. We're coming pretty close to the end. I just want to go through a couple more cases with you. Um, here, a, a, a tooth, a molar tooth that was deemed non-restorable, um, we remove the tooth. It is rare that I will immediately place an implant in a maxillary molar tooth because there's three sockets, and it's rare that I can put that implant ideally. So I will remove the tooth, take a radiograph, make sure that um, there's no roots left, and I will graft it. And you can see the grafting material is rather radio-opaque, but in a four-month period, you can see how the, the, the material actually objectively changes. Here I'm going to do a what we call a flapless procedure. I'm taking what we call a tissue punch, remove the soft tissue onto, from the surgical site, and again going through the osteotomy procedure. I'm going to widen the osteotomy, and here I'm taking what we call an osteotome. And I actually, rather than taking a drill, um, and drilling out bone, I'm going to take an instrument that is going to condense the bone and lift the Schneiderian membrane, lift that sinus up. It's called the sinus tempting procedure. And again, if you go to drkaczynski.com, we have several um, demonstrations of this. So I'm actually condensing the lateral walls and lifting the Schneiderian membrane. I'm then going to take my um, osteogen plug and I'm going to place it into that 
that created site and and condense it up that becomes my new floor and then i'm going to place my implant into that area place a cover screw and you can see <clears throat> you can see it digitally with the digital radiograph but you can see it on the immediate post operative cbct how we kind of have a uh, parachute effect we actually lifted that floor of the sinus up uh, with our material fairly routine okay the last thing i wanted to demonstrate uh, before we get into our questions uh, with lauren is uh, ridge splitting techniques and uh, here's a short little video that i'd like to demonstrate so patient presented um, with a mess. And so we, we removed some teeth and um, as a, we didn't immediately load this case, rather I fabricated a flipper, but I kept a couple teeth to hold that um, palletless partial in place. I evaluated the, the site with our CBCT analysis and you can see the anterior ridge area was very thin and she had a huge incisive um, foramen area. So we're going to atraumatically, minimally traumatically remove the, um, the teeth that need to be extracted. And the tooth with very little pressure, very little time is luxated up and out. And I take my tooth delivery instrument, I'm able to remove that tooth in a matter of seconds without very much trauma. Real time removing that tooth. I'm going to make my incision, my crustal incision. I need to evaluate the hard tissue here. We're going to, we're making a concentric circle here. We also have to elevate the palatal tissue. I wanna see the entire site. You can see how thin that, that um, premaxillary bone is in this situation. So we have a couple sites that we can, we can immediately place an implant. Here I'm just flattening the ridge, removing any spicules with our electric motor. Removing any, I'm going to make little bleeding points onto the facial aspect. And I'm going to use a piezo. For those of you who are not familiar with the piezo, um, it is a ultrasonic uh, instrument that will allow me to very precisely um, work on hard tissue only and almost like a um, dishwasher door. So very, very slowly, uh, copious amount of water. Uh, it's an ultrasonic um, vibration. It's, it's like, like, cutting through, like cutting through butter with, with a warm knife. I don't wanna say a hot knife, but a warm knife. And so what I'm doing is just right in the center of that ridge, going down probably about eight millimeters. And then I'm going to make a little um, uh, dishwasher vertical incision. And what we're going to do is let our implant actually push that facial plate of bone and lingual a palatal plate of bone out so that we can maintain, here I'm making my little vertical trap door so that the bone can easily move. And I'm gonna go ahead and do my implant procedure, small burr, wider burr, wider burr, into our might immediate extraction sites. Threading the implants in place. You can see the defect. For doctors, we can grow facial blown. 
And same thing, I'm just taking a very, very thin 2.4 diameter burr. And I'm actually just, just placing the implants and pushing that facial plate of bone out. So I have a wall that's created. I'm then gonna take my gold, gold dent um, graft material, allograft material, and I'm gonna fill in those voids with a little curette. Fill in those voids. Now, again, we're drawing blood and we're gonna centrifuge it and we're gonna create a fibrin clot, which will become my membrane which will allow for excellent soft tissue and hard tissue healing. We're um, condensing it and you can see our membrane is very easily passively placed. We're going to suture to sites in place and we went from a very thin ridge to an acceptable result with our grafting and our PRF material. The piezo really is an outstanding tool to be able to accomplish. The, the two teeth will be removed upon final seating um, in this situation. This is not a great case to immediate load. The patient wore a flipper over those two remaining teeth, post-operative CBCT analysis, shows that we do indeed have a facial wall. One week post-op, the vicral sutures from Golden Dent, Gold Dent are removed. Four months, we, we make our impression. And we fabricate a smile composer, which is just a, a composite material to evaluate aesthetics for the patient, smile design. And then a final Bruxer or final Zirconia bridge is fabricated the day that we, we uh, see. I'm going to remove those two non-functional non teeth. You can graft them again with our Osteogen plug and see our final prosthesis for our patient. We call this a sequential approach, um, but this is certainly something within your wheelhouse, something that you are able to accomplish in your practice um, with, with a little bit of experience. We must follow certain rules. You must protect, you must protect the graft material from invagination of epithelium. Take your time and do a great result. Couple of minutes early, Lauren, but I'm sure we have some questions that I'd love to address. We do, but initially what I want to do is, is turn the uh, screen over to Kurt Lawler from Golden Dent. Um, as uh, we, we talked about at the beginning, uh, a lot of these uh, products are unique to, uh, to Golden Dent. Uh, Kurt is always great about offering specials uh, for people on the webinar. He'll go over that as well as some educational opportunities. Um, just as a reminder for those of you who may have logged on a little bit late, uh, for continuing education, if you were here for the webinar, you will be sent the CE form. There's nothing you need to do. There's no quiz or test or anything you need to do when you log out. Uh, the, the whole list will be sent to Golden Dent. They will ensure that that gets out within the next couple of weeks. So, uh, Kurt, uh, pleased to have you here and please take it away. All right. Thanks, Lauren. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Kurt Lawler. I'm with Golden Dent here in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, we are a, uh, this is 80 years of Detroit Dental because we are a third generational dental family. Uh, got into the dental product aspect of the business in 2007 uh, with the physics forceps. And since then, we've just been adding uh, simple, predictable, and unconventional, uh, unique niche products um, that I'll go through here quickly. And uh, like I said, started with the physics forceps. So I thank everybody for joining this evening. And like I said, I'll get through this quickly so we can uh, move on to the Q&A session. So on pretty much any webinar, we always provide a discount code. Um, I'll go ahead and, and mention this first. Um, we do this just as a thank you for investing your time with us this evening. Um, and then we also do issue the, uh, the one CE credit. Uh, the code for this evening is uh, it's just plus 10, so it's P-L-U-S, uh, the numeric one zero. 
and that will allow you to uh, save 10% on any of our uh, products or our educational programs, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So the uh, the website's uh, golden, and there's a dash in there, so golden-dent.com, and then obviously if you have any questions, you can uh, give us a call in the office. Uh, we do these deals for uh, just kind of a quick 24-hour deal. Um, that's normally how we do them on any webinar, so the deal will expire tomorrow, uh, March 3rd, uh, end of the day, uh, or I guess midnight tomorrow. Uh, so if you have any uh, interest in trying any of the products that were shown this evening uh, in your hands, just um, uh, give us a call uh, tomorrow, please. So like I said, the physics forceps is kind of what started it for us um, back in 07. This was kind of already explained in pretty good detail on a lot of past webinars. Uh, but this is our most popular set of instruments called our standard series. Uh, it's four instruments. There's one lower and three uppers. Uh, if anybody's never used this product before, I would definitely uh, recommend taking a look at these first versus um, another set we have, which is our Molar Series set of two. Uh, these provide better leverage and are easier to use, and it's always a great way to evaluate the product because we do have a, uh, a trial period. So there's, uh, do you have to uh, elevate in advance? Uh, you know, for many years we always said no, and many People still do not elevate in advance, but if you want to make the, the procedure obviously um, even easier or less atraumatic, you can, you can use luxators or we have a product we like that's called the wedge or um, in the bottom right there, we have a, a product called the separators. They'll all work in, a, in the same manner. It just starts to uh, elevate the tooth a little bit, separate the tissue, and that'll make the use of the physics forceps um, just a little bit easier and, and uh, prevent any tissue damage. Um, if you're not into the physics forceps uh, technique or if you're looking to upgrade some of your conventional instruments um, and obviously there's many times you still need to use these types of instruments um, we went ahead and made a, a nice series of instruments these aren't too expensive or anything uh, where it's a standard 150 151 ash and all your conventional instruments so i just wanted to mention we do have those available too i know we didn't uh, demonstrate this these this evening but we do have them on our site so i wanted to mention them this is our complete graph kit uh, we worked with uh, Dr. Kaczynski a while ago to kind of design this and pick each specific instrument uh, to have it in the cassette and have it ready for your grafting procedure so you're not looking all over for each individual instrument, I guess, when you have a grafting uh, case. This has the uh, the Orban knife, which was mentioned, and, and the curette um, and the other instruments that you need for grafting. Uh, this is an inexpensive kit. You know, it looks nice, and you can just keep everything together for your grafting procedures. We also have two obviously more advanced instruments, uh, needle holders and some various scissors. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to, to go through each one of these, but each one is actually quite unique. Um, some of them have a like a suture cutter on them, uh, and these really are quite special instruments. Uh, on our website, there's videos and things that explain them. But one of the most popular things is there's really just no joints. So we call them like our snagless needle holders, because uh, I know it can be quite annoying if the suture catches on the, uh, the joints. So that's uh, one real big benefit of these. Um, these needle holders we have. This is a great burr kit, so this is perfect for some of the cases that were shown this evening. We have, uh, when you can't, I guess, manually uh, curette the socket site, or if you want to uh, curette or degranulate the, the socket site a little bit better, we have um, some of these really nice tissue and degranulation burrs, and then we have uh, two uh, like bone leveling or shaping burrs, a good cutting burr, and then uh, one more uh, bone shaping burr. So this is a nice kit if you're doing um, crafting type cases to keep together. Um, these are obviously not one time one time type use burrs, and you just keep them together here in this nice little um, this little burr block. So our bone. So there's not much more to say about this. So, you know, our allograft is uh, we have it in a, a DBM putty form, and then the particulate allograft or like the powder type form. Um, we we've, we've had this product for quite some time. The feedback's always been excellent. The clinical results are good, and we think the uh, the pricing is fair. So. If you use another brand, I um, encourage you to take a look at our, at our Gold Oss Allograph brand. Plugs, uh, this is one of our more popular products. We've we've had this for a while now and, and uh, the sales continue to, to grow each year and I know people are very happy using this product. Uh, as was demonstrated this evening, you know, it's easy to use, the cost is, is good and uh, the clinical results are great. So uh, we have these two uh, sizes, the large and the slim, and then there's also actually a new size this year um, they actually have an extra large size, which is available now. Uh, it's a 15 by 20 instead of the 10 by 20. So it's a, a 2.25 times size of material for maybe like larger type defect cases. 
And then uh, for anybody that's already using the product, I just wanted to mention the uh, the product now actually comes in a 10 pack also. So they're historically have always had a five pack. We now have the 10 packs available. I'm just mentioning that for anybody that's already using them now. Uh, EpiGuide, uh, we show this in great detail. The product on the left is our most popular. It's a long lasting resorbable membrane. Um, great product, it's fully synthetic, uh, easy to handle. The only issue, it's kind of large. Um, so a lot of doctors do pre-cut the, uh, the membrane. Um, that's the, uh, the only downside on it, it's just kind of a big sheet. Uh, our PGA sutures, uh, we already talked about that, so I'm not going to mention much more, but we also do have the uh, black silk uh, sutures, if that's uh, something you currently like to use. These are uh, very inexpensive, uh, the BioViva black silk sutures, and then we have our own uh, PGA brand sutures, too, in a, a 3.0 and a 4.0 size. BioViva, uh, we didn't we didn't show this this evening, but this is um, this is a great product to control bleeding. Uh, if you're not going to graft a site or say it's a third molar, um, you can put this hemostatic gauze in the socket site. It uh, promotes uh, healing, uh, prevents, uh, I guess, if you have a, a bleeding issue. Um, it really kind of replaces uh, sort of the function of a gel foam, and uh, it's extremely affordable. It's just a really great product. Um, just a couple more things I'll mention here. Uh, this, you know, with today's day and age, um, maybe you've seen some uh, information out there about the molecular iodine uh, pre-rinse or pre-procedural rinses. Um, there's all kinds of documented studies that we keep adding to our website um, pretty much each week because there's more and more great data that shows this is very effective. Um, basically, you know, with, with the current environment of COVID, um, you'll see it's um, a lot stronger than uh, some of the other material, the other rinses that you may be using and uh, has a lot of really great benefits. So this is a product we've seen a lot of interest in lately, and it's uh, something that if you wanted to read up on it, the, the IO rinse uh, ready to use has been a really popular product for us. Um, this is really off subject, so I'm not really gonna mention it too much, but I'm just mentioning it because if uh, your regular uh, customer or if you join our web webinars on a regular basis, and, and if you weren't aware, we uh, recently launched a full endo line. So if you're using like a pro taper type file, that's what we started with. Um, we've got a great endo motor, obviously the gutta percha paper points, metal pins, fiber posts. Um, again, I don't have time to go through this right now, but I just wanted to mention, uh, take a look at our website. We have a whole new endo section and we um, had great feedback on that so far. So if you wanna learn, uh, Extractions, grafting, media dentures. Uh, we took quite a bit of time off just due to the with COVID, but uh, looks like we're going to start our programs back up this fall. And so I went ahead and put a date uh, up on the website for each one of our programs. Uh, it's on AmplifyDental.com. That goes over all of our live patient type courses. Uh, we see anywhere from around like 100 patients, and class sizes are usually I don't know 15, 25, just depends on the course. And uh, you get to do all the procedures, so it's a it's worth uh, making the trip to Detroit, and um, it's a great learning experience. Um, I know Dr. Krasinski already mentioned his website this evening that has a lot of these cases too. But if you uh, subscribe to our uh, YouTube page, you'll see that we do post a lot of these cases on a regular basis. Also, um, a lot of really great uh, techniques to pick up, and uh, other cases from Dr. Krasinski. Um, so uh, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you get a chance, or if you're uh, visiting YouTube, uh, you'll get a lot of great videos each month. So that's it. I'll turn it back to Lauren for the uh, questions and uh, Dr. Krasinski, and I appreciate everybody's time this evening. Thank you, Kurt. Since we still have you here for a second, because we do have a couple of Canadian uh, people on, um, are the products all available in Canada? Are they Health Canada approved? Uh, you know, I will say this, put it this way, I guess. Um, you know, I don't have a specific list of every single one that may be Health Canada approved, but I know we uh, we ship to Canada daily, I guess, to answer the question that way. Um, uh, so, yes, they're available to, to Canadian dentists. And, you know, if there's a specific right. product they're looking for or any kind of documentation, they can they can contact us and ask us, but I know we do ship there okay. daily. Perfect. What about, like, Australia or other countries, or is it mostly just North America? Uh, you know, I guess it depends on the product. I mean, we do have distributors and things in different markets. Um, so, uh, I mean, let's put it this way. If people order online, we'll, you know, we ship. We ship out of the country, obviously, every day also. Uh, so, um, it, it shouldn't be a problem. It just depends on the product. If they wanted to contact us and ask us, that's fine. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, Tim, you ready for some questions? Sure. 
Okay, here we go. Here's one from an, another Canadian. Um, I placed an implant in the 17 area, and since I'm from Canada, I know that is tooth number two, upper right second molar. Um, so I, I placed an implant in the upper right second molar. I had done a sinus bump in preparation for the implant of an 11 and a half millimeter implant. Um, unfortunately, the assistant uh, pulled out a 16 millimeter implant, and it's that's now sitting about four and a half millimeters into the sinus. Um, should I just remove the implant and place the 11 and a half millimeter? Noble active that was in the original plan. Um, I don't want it to integrate and then have to remove it. In Carl Misch's textbook, he talked about doing an apicoectomy, but how do you do that without spreading titanium all over throughout the sinus floor? Wow, that's quite a first question, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, it's um, the longest one I've seen, so I figured we'd get that one out of the way. Yeah, um, in, in, I mean, I'm just going to be very honest here. Um, I would remove it. I would graft it, I would let it heal, and I would replace the implant later. Because with, especially with Noble Active, very aggressive threads, uh, I'm, I'm sure you perforated through, um, through the sinus floor, um, and so you're not going to get granulation. You're not going to get um, osteointegration around the apical uh, portion of the implant, and I would be concerned about the long-term effect uh, of that. I, I, that's what I would do. I would just remove it, graft it, let it heal. Uh, and then come back in five months or so and replace the implant correctly. Okay. Um, Tony's asking again about the uh, the website for the hands-on course. That's Amplified Dental, correct? Is it, is it AmplifiedDental.com? It, that's correct, yes. Okay, great. Um, in one of the cases, so, you know, you're still working under the concept, though, Tim, that you have to have some adequate bone apically for for primary stability correct correct okay um is the osteogen sheet covering the implant in other words is the implant under the osteogen sheet or membrane yes yes These are easy, it's easy, not it's easy not easy the answer. bone's not going to necessarily grow over the top of that that cover screw okay um, are patients generally receptive to you using bovine collagen membrane when you inform them? Um, well, I, again, the answer is uh, to that question is yes. Um, obviously, we have to be very honest with our patients, especially in Detroit area. We have a lot of ethnic uh, areas, and um, we, you know our options are limited. We have a synthetic material, the osteogen material that we talked about but it is in a bovine matrix versus using uh, human bone, um, which is you know, obviously uh, uh, accumulated from, from another human. So those are the options that we have. As far as the membrane goes, the EpiGuide uh, material that we talked about is, is truly synthetic. Uh, so there's no animal products in that whatsoever. Okay. Um... Would you ever consider wetting the bone graft with some type of antibiotic like lincecan or, or something similar to that? You no, know, I, I hear that a lot. You know, in, in 36 years of practice, Lauren, um, uh, and, and you you may have done it in, in your practice, um, it kind of comes and goes. And to be honest with you, I do not do that. And I get great results without doing that. Uh, although I've heard many, many speakers say that they, they use tetracycline or, or whatever, um, I, I, that's just not part of my protocol uh, in, in my practice. I haven't found it to be necessary. Okay. Um, I think that's one of the cases you showed with a molar. Why no osteogen plug with the molar implant procedure? Um, I, what I was showing is, is, is the same, um, same tooth contralateral where one we use osteogen and when we use allograft material. And I just wanted to show that the results were basically the same. Um, with with a reduced fee, a reduced cost to to the dentist using the osteogen material. It's not a right or wrong, okay. Lauren. It's not a right or wrong because uh, we get great results with both. Uh, it's more a matter of um, simplicity. You know, our, our practices are very busy, and my my guess that what I'd like to leave our, our audience with is, if you're taking a tooth out, it's imperative that you graft it. Uh, if there's any consideration for for a future implant, because if you don't, you don't really know where that that hard tissue, that bone's going to heal, 
and you may not be able to place an implant um, later without a more invasive procedure. Okay. Um, for osteoplug, any contraindications? Are there special post-operative instructions? Uh, you know, I, th I think one of the cases you showed uh, using an epiguide over the plug. Um, but why use that if you didn't have to have primary closure? So, so the, the, the important thing is, if you have a socket site, Lauren, with all the walls intact, all, all four walls are intact, we can use an osteogen plug without a membrane, and the epithelium will grow over the top of it. If we have a defect on the facial aspect, I prefer to put some type of membrane onto that facial aspect to to prevent um, a concavity formation uh, of that facial plate. Um, that's just been my protocol. If the facial wall is missing, I will put a membrane there to protect it, regardless of what material I use. Okay. And what about um, are there any reasons when you wouldn't use an osteo plug and any special instructions that you give those um, patients post operatively? No, again, if if there's a significant facial defect, I'll use an allograft material. Um, if post operatively, um, remember you don't need primary closure. So I tell people number one, ice to the outside of the face. We give them a low dose of antibiotic, 500 milligrams amoxicillin, three times a day for three days. I can start the day before if possible. Rare that we give any type of of narcotic, um, just um, ibuprofen, 600 milligrams um, as needed for discomfort. Um, I tell them no heavy spitting, no straws and no crunchy foods like nacho chips, potato chips. I also tell them that the material itself is white in color. So if a family member looks in their mouth and they see something white, I don't want them to think it's pus. It's not, it's supposed to stay there. And even when I see the patient in a week and 10 days after and I remove the sutures, I'll, I'll actually show them, sometimes the material will be off white color. And I'll tell them that's, that's normal, that's, that's supposed to be there. And I always tell them that the gum tissue or epithelium grows a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So I can give them a pretty good estimate and when that, that whole uncovering will completely heal over. You know, okay. talking to the patients is really important. The, the more they understand, the better the result. It's when we, we forget to tell them things that uh, it becomes a mystery and, and, a, and a challenge for them. Right. Is there a, a general rule of thumb of when you would use the punch technique versus raising a flap? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I do more and more reflections right now. Uh, if, if there's any question about the anatomy, then reflect it. If you can see it, you can fix it. Um, however, if you have a wide arch and you're able to determine uh, either through CBCT analysis or, or visual, um, and you do have a band of attached gingiva that's adequate. Um, you know, a punch technique is less invasive uh, for the patient, uh, less traumatic, um, less post-operative um, um, uh, discomfort, no need for suture removal. So, but if there's any question, and especially in the aesthetic zone, uh, I think it's. I think most of the most of the failures that I had, Lauren, uh, over the years. It's because I placed the implant too far facial. Um, and if I had reflected the area, I, I would have known not to put it so far facial. Does that make sense? Yep. Well, let, let's, let, there's a follow-up question to that. Um, so let's say someone did place an implant on a defective, you know, buckle bone case, they, they closed it up, it failed, it you know, came out within a couple of weeks. What now? What what's the protocol? Uh, you know, they didn't probably they didn't do any bone graft initially. So you, well, how mean, would you recover you from can, that? You can grow a facial plate predictably. That means one wall is missing. If more than one wall is missing, it's very very challenging for us as general dentists to to grow bone in two dimensions. So in those situations, um, then an, an autologous graft. A block raft is is indicated for those areas. It, it's just it's it's a that's a much more involved procedure to to grow two walls as opposed to one wall. Um, and so graft and then wait x number of months before you come back in and try to place yeah, the implant. Probably about six months. Yeah. Yep. Okay. 
let's see. Do you always need a membrane with the uh, osteogen? No. If you have if you have just a socket site, I would not put a membrane on it. If the facial wall is missing, say beyond two, three, four millimeters, I would put a membrane to protect the facial plate. Okay. Uh, this may be kind of a hard question to answer because there's a lot of stuff here, but how do you decide when you use osteogen versus allograft and when to use PRF versus osteogen versus membrane? Uh, that's, a, no, that's a very, that's a very, very legitimate question. Um, the I'm not saying it wasn't, I'm just saying it could be a long answer. <laughs> the, the osteogen, well, I'll try not to make it too long. The osteogen is, is very convenient, right? You open the package, you, you kind of push it in and you suture over the top of it. If the facial wall is missing, I will normally use an allograft. If the facial wall is missing, I don't normally use osteogen. I'll use osteogen when I have a socket where all the walls are intact. Um, if you use the allograft, then you have to have a membrane to protect it from invagination of epithelium. The PRF is, is very, very nice um, for my, my, usually my bigger cases, my, sedate, my sedation cases because I already have a line in place. Um, it, it's the amount of time that you, that you have to spend with your patients. The, the results are going to be identical as long as you follow the protocol that, that we discussed in the program tonight. Okay. It's not um, a right A couple wrong. questions here. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, a couple questions here about, um, do you have any familiarity experience with uh, Densa birds? I guess, I think Versa makes those instead of ridge splitting. Um, you know, someone saying they've had good success with the the, the densifying yeah, birds. It's, How do they a, differ from osteotomes? It's 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 a technique. Um, um, it, it's a technique that that in the literature it looks like it works very well. Many of my colleagues have used it. Um, you know, it's it is another way of of getting the result. Um, I know that I can tent uh, the sinus floor three millimeters and immediately place an implant very predictably. You know, we get as dentists, we get very com comfortable with our procedures, but the the dense bird is I I've heard really nice things about it. Okay. Um. So I'll, I'll give you a case here and uh, let me know what what you would do. So a couple of implants going in at number twenty nine and thirty, the knife edge ridge, eleven and a half millimeter implants. They can probably get three quarters of the implant completely in bone, but the the top quarter or so is going to have exposed threads. Um, do you just, uh, would you split the ridge? Do you uh, do like an oxygen sheet covering those threads? Uh, you know, if you only have a couple of millimeters exposed, what would you recommend? Yeah, yeah it, it's almost impossible to get, again, it, that's more than, the more than two walls are missing. It's almost impossible to get uh, that width corrected. Uh, by by doing a grafting procedure, and, and ne nearly impossible to do that. Um, so when the ridge is thin like that, I would do um, a block graft, an autogenous a bone graft from the symphysis, from the ramus, and build that bone up ideally, especially in the molar area. I mean, it has to be a wider implant. Uh, you, you, you know, we shouldn't be putting skinny implants back in the molar area. Right. Is that that split ridge technique, like the one that you showed in the upper works, anterior, it, would that work in the molar area, or is that split split? You know, if splitting the ridge in uh, you know D one and D two bone is is a little bit more challenging um, than in the maxillary bone. You know, it can be very very dense bone. So uh, yeah, it's a procedure that that could be attempted, um, but in most situations where I know that I don't have enough horizontal bone then um, either I or I'll work with my oral surgeon to, to build that bone up uh, with an autogenous block. For that split ridge technique, is there a minimum thickness of the ridge that you, you wouldn't try to split it beyond, you know, if it was anything less than that? Well, you know, you need, you, you need, you want at least two millimeters to go facial and two millimeters to go palatal or lingual. So, um, you know, probably about six millimeters. Okay. Uh, let's see. I want to try to get as many of these as, as we can. Um, so, you know, if you don't need primary uh, closure, you, and you, let's say you have a collagen resorbable membrane, if you have 
four or five millimeters exposed, is that okay? Is there a certain number that you can't really have it beyond that? Okay, great question. Um, it's imperative that you use a membrane that lasts at least six weeks. There's a lot of, lot of materials out there, and I, and I say this all the time, you know, you're gonna have a sales rep come in and say, oh, my membrane's a lot cheaper. Um, the question that the doctor should ask is how long does it last? If they don't know the answer to that, then I wouldn't use it. You need a high quality membrane, and most of the resorbable membranes that we have today last three, four months, if not longer. I just need it there for six weeks. Epithelium will grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So if you have a 10 millimeter defect, it could take 20 days, it could take three weeks for it to close completely. But as long as that membrane is passively placed, Lauren, on the facial and the lingual or palatal aspect, and it doesn't dislodge, you're going to get a predictable result. When we don't get predictability is when that membrane is lost before that amount of time. So even if you had four or five millimeters exposure, that's okay as long as the membrane is in place. Correct. Okay. Um, what about uh, if you extract a tooth and it's, you know, it's an active infection, it's purulent, uh, are you still going to graft or should you put them on antibiotics and, and wait? Uh, you know, how do you typically deal with so those So that, that's another great question. So the, the important thing is to curette, 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 get rid of as much granulation as you can. Um, sometimes I'll use a laser in that area, a diode laser. Um, um, I, I may use a burr that, that, that Kurt mentioned from, from Gold Dent. Um, I don't have a problem grafting an infected site. I never place an implant in a, an infected site. What do I mean by that? If you've ever had a, I use this analogy all the time, if you've ever had a hangnail, it's, you're miserable. You can't walk, it hurts so bad. You soak your foot in the tub, you cut the nail, five minutes later you forgot that it, you even had a problem there. The body's an amazing thing, and once the source of the infection is eliminated, the body normally will heal very well, as long as they're not immunocompromised. Okay. Um, in that first case that we talked about, in the first question about um, a sinus exposure, how long does it typically take for that uh, to close up? I would, I would in, in that area, I wait six months. Okay. Um, and the membranes you're using, are, are, are you always using resorbable or are there some times where you use ones that have to be removed? No, I, I always use a resorbable membrane today because our, our, our modern resorbable membranes last much longer than six weeks. So, so you don't need to inventory a lot of product. You know, years ago we used to use um, a Gore, Gore-Tex material and you had to get primary closure with that material, which was challenging because that meant that you were pulling the mucosa onto the facial aspect of where you wanted to put our implant. And um, it, it doesn't exist anymore. We, you, don't, you don't buy that material. So um, there's really no indication, for, in my opinion, to use a non-resorbable membrane uh, as long as you're using a high quality resorbable membrane that's going to last at least six weeks, and most of them are lasting three, four, five months. They're engineered that way. Yeah, when I started my perio, you know, when I, I was a perio, I started in 92, and I, Cortex was all we had, and I don't have fond memories of that. So, nope. Nope. Um, that, that technique that you show with the, um, the ridge blend, with that dishwasher door technique, how, you know, how tall or big is that vertical slice with the, the piezo that you made towards the vestibule? I'll, I'll go uh, eight, to ten, eight to 10 millimeters deep, yeah. Okay. And then I can basically, I'll just take my pilot burr and I can actually just thread the implant. The implant will kind of push everything um, um, facially and, and palatally. It's a great instrument. Yeah. Uh, Okay, yep. And speaking of that ridge split, uh, what about post-op as far as medications, uh, both pain meds, uh, antibiotics, anything like that? Low dose of it, as long as there's no active infection, amoxicillin three times a day for three days. If I can start the night before, great. Uh, many of our patients, you know, we do surgery the day we meet them, so uh, for three days. And then just ibuprofen, 600 milligrams, PRN pain. Okay. Do you have a favorite type of loops and, and lights that you uh, recommend? Um, you know, I, I'm kind of a Denmat guy, um, and I think that the, the Denmat materials um, are, are I, I think they're the best um, because they care so much, uh, and they really, really want you to to be successful with them. And I really like their um, 
their um, um, wireless ones, you know, the wireless lights. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty awesome. Great. Well, we're at the bottom of the hour here. And as I mentioned, when we first started, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, for those of you who may have come a little bit late or in the middle, uh, if you were here for the bulk of the presentation, you will be sent a, uh, a CE certificate. There's nothing you need to do, no quiz or anything like that. Uh, the whole list of who was here and how long they were here gets sent to Golden Dent. Uh, they will send out the CE forms. It usually takes, I don't know, a couple of weeks, uh, give it a little bit of time. Um, but, uh, and I, and for those of you who we didn't get to all your questions, I mentioned at the beginning, we, we don't get to all the questions. I try to get to as many as possible. I do apologize. There were about seven or eight questions that remain here, but as I said, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, Tim, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, you know, we're always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, one of the reasons I, I love having you on is, you know, I've seen dozens and dozens of your webinars and, it's new stuff every time. I'm not sure where you get all these cases from. Well, if you've done 15,000 implants, I guess you got a few cases. But um, anything you'd like to say before we uh, wrap it up? No, thank you, Lauren. You always make me you always make me laugh. I appreciate it. And everybody, um, let's pray for safety and and get everybody the country back to, back to work and and uh, stay safe and and be good and get out there and do this stuff. You know, um, the courses. Um, that Golden Dent are very unique at the dental school. You know, working on 100 patients, you know, with with you know 20 doctors is is a pretty amazing day. It's hard work, uh, but that's the best way to learn. Um, I'm a big continuing education junkie, and I think that the more you see, the 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 more proficient you are. Well, I agree, and it looks like we're going to be hopefully there sooner than later that we're doing live classes again. Um, for those of you, again, you know, I also met on top of the CE, but if you didn't make it to the whole presentation, it, it has been recorded. That recording should go out sometime in the next day or two as well. Um, not only am I thanking Dr. Kaczynski for his time, but thanks to Golden Dent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these webinars do not make themselves. Uh, it takes a lot of time and planning, and there's no way I could do it without their help. And thanks to them, you see that promo code up there, the plus 10. Uh, Kurt had mentioned that that code is good for 24 hours. That means don't call them in two or three days and say, hey, I still want that that promo. It, it's going to be gone. Um, but as, as Kurt mentioned, uh, they do have a, a money back uh, guarantee. So uh, you really have to have no risk here. So thank you all for joining. We know that your time is valuable. We do these webinars on a regular basis, uh, usually about one a month or so. So any of you that were here tonight will be on the list to get an invitation for the next webinar. Please stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to seeing you all on future webinars. Good night, everyone. Good night.